Um, so welcome. Thanks for joining us for Growing Culinary Herbs Mostly for Beginners. My name is Darby Love. I'm an adult services librarian at Vancouver Island Regional Library in Nanaimo. And before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking from Stonema and Stonanus, or First Nations. And we're not all under the same roof. Somebody's from Indiana. Was that right? Panoka? Florida? Wow. Mostly Vancouver Island, but there's some like exotic locales in here. And um, yeah, thanks for putting in where you're from. Just take a moment to reflect on the land that you're on today. And we'd really, really like to extend our heartfelt thanks to the Vancouver Island Master Gardeners for partnering with Burrell, that's Vancouver Island Regional Library, on this program. And special thanks to Joanne Canning for her key role in creating the program and also to Richard Bernier for taking on the fun task of coordinating all the dates and the people and all the little descriptions and stuff. He's been awesome. Some housekeeping items. We are recording the session today. No one's image or personal information will be captured whatsoever in the recording. Like for example, the chat will not be captured. And please do use the chat um, for comments, uh, but we would like your questions to be in the Q&A tab on the bottom. That just helps so that we don't miss any because we get to mark them as completed, et cetera. So please try to use the Q&A feature and, um, for your actual questions because we'll have a presentation by Dorothy and then she'll take the questions at the end. All right, um, that sounds great. So now for Dorothy, Dorothy Kieser has been a certified master gardener for many years. She said 15, I think. She brings to the library seminars her scientific approach from her career as a biologist as well as a wealth of experience from her own extensive home orchard, vegetable, flower, and rhododendron gardens. In addition to her volunteer work with the Master Gardeners, Dorothy is an active member of the Bevan Learning Garden, which is a large local community garden featuring a greenhouse. I've got a friend who volunteers there too, and has given numerous seminars on many gardening topics. Her name is familiar here to gardening clubs and associations and the library folks. Dorothy is the past president of Vancouver Island Master Garden Chapter, BIMGA, and is currently the lead mentor for the Advanced Master Gardeners course given jointly by Vancouver Island University and BIMGA. Dorothy, take it away. Thanks, Darby. Now that we've conquered all the technological problems that we had at the beginning, it's fun to talk to the, the audience that's obviously very widespread geographically. But I'm sure we're all gardeners at heart. And so welcome all you other gardeners and welcome all you cooks, because after all, why would you want to listen to a seminar on growing culinary herbs if you're not cooking with them? And what a wonderful thing culinary herbs are. But this seminar is meant primarily for beginners. I mean, if you are an experienced master gardener, there's probably, or not master gardener necessarily, but gardener, there's probably not much I can tell you about that, but you might enjoy the images and just listening to, about talks, uh, about herbs. So I had to look up what a herb actually is. It's a plant of which the leaves, seeds, flowers, and roots are used for food, medicine, scent, or flavor. And since I'm not going to go at all into the medicinal aspect of it or into the perfume aspect of it, I'm only going to go into the culinary end of things. And even the culinary end is, um, is a wide field. And we all know about the standard pairings of herbs of, uh, you know, we all know about tomato, basil, cucumber, dill, but there are so many other herbs and many, many other uses. So that's what I want to talk about. But I also want to say that many of the herbs are excellent pollinator plants and many of them are great ornamentals. So they have a multitude of uses. So before I go on, I just have to do a little bit of housekeeping. There we go. And that's to say, of course, as Darby already said, I'm Dorothy Kieser, I'm a certified master gardener. 
And we do these seminars in partnership with the Vancouver Island Regional Library the, from the Harborfront branch. What I really want to say though, is that commercial use of any of this seminar or its contents is prohibited unless you get written permission and that the information in the seminar is as science-based and accurate as I could possibly make it. So hopefully you'll learn something from this. So now we get into the real meat of the matter. I think one of the key things when you're growing something that you want to eat is that you don't have to walk for miles and miles. You want to have, especially the herbs, very close to your kitchen. So think about how close can you get to your kitchen in terms of growing your herbs. Um, and there's a multitude of ways of doing that. You can either have your bed of herbs very close to your kitchen if that works in your garden, or you can have a great number of herbs in a container. Um, and the container thing is really very nice. A, you can move them around as you need them. B, you can have them close to your kitchen. And C, if, or, and many other things, but if you have a very small place or even just a patio or a veranda or um, anything that's very space limited, then a container, still gives you all kinds of choices for herbs. And there's very few that I'll be talking about that wouldn't do reasonably well in a container, provided it's reasonably good. And then you have to think, of course, as you're growing herbs, what kind of containers you would like. On the bottom right, you of course see a very pretty container made out of a woven basket that's probably lined and has, I can see rosemary and parsley and chives in there but you can get all kinds of other containers. And let me just say a few words about containers. Um, of course, the cheapest container are the black plastic pots. And uh, they're great, they're easily accessible. Um, they don't mind freezing in the winter, but the difficulty with it is most herbs want to be in a sunny spot. And so a black plastic container, you can just imagine what happens to the roots close to the container. They can get fried. So unless you uh, have a little bit of shade on the container, the black plastic might not be the best thing. Um, the terracotta containers are lovely. They're breathable, but that also means that uh, they lose water more rapidly. And so they need a bit more watering, but they're very easy on the roots, but they're not frost hardy. The, my own favorites are the glazed ceramics. They look nice. They're not as breathable. Many of them, however, are made to be frost hardy, but they're incredibly heavy. So if, if weight is a problem, then that may not be it. And then of course, there's the frost hardy, lightweight pseudo terracotta, which is really a plastic, but uh, it looks terracotta like, so that's very nice. Um, the other generality that I want to deal with before I get to the actual herbs is um, the water needs. Now you have to think, where did a lot of our herbs originate? A lot of our herbs, think rosemary, um, oregano, all those kind of things originated in the Mediterranean. Well, what kind of condition do you get in the Mediterranean? You get dry, it's usually a bit gravelly, rocky, and so you want to give your herbs that kind of environment so that they really thrive. So again, when you plant them into a container, give them a fairly light soil with a fair number of, of grit in it and, uh, and good drainage, and then just see how much water they actually need. One of the nice things, certainly living in our area, we have a great number of deer around. So unless we live in a very enclosed space, Deer are always a bit of an issue, but because the herbs have a very strong scent, you'll find that the bulk of them are totally deer resistant. So, um, and the last thing I wanted to say about location is herbs are really very pretty. When you think of a bed of cardoon or artichoke, artichokes are beautiful, beautiful plants in the thistle family with a purple big flower. If you think of borage, fine dill, assorted thymes, all these things are lovely, lovely to have close by and, uh, and have at your hand as you're wanting to make supper or, or lunchtime. 
And then of course, there's also flowers that you can eat. Um, so I'll include some of those in my talk. Um, are they culinary herbs? I suppose that's a question of definition, but they're lovely. When you think of the dianthus or pink that's in the upper left, it has a delicious clove taste if you want to put that into some baking. The rose is a lovely thing just to sprinkle onto a salad and it gives a bit of flavor. The bergamot is, or bee balm has a minty citrusy flavor. Nasturtium is peppery. Everything on the nasturtium is edible. The flowers are beautiful in a salad. The leaves are very tasty. Um, the only thing I would say about the nasturtium, if you want to put the flowers in a salad, think of that little spur that's at the end of a nasturtium flower. It has a nectar. And so sometimes little bugs um, get trapped in there. And so you might want to pinch that spur off if you don't want those little bugs in your salad. And of course, calendula gives a nice uh, bitter peppery flavor to any salad. So beautiful to uh, have these flowers in with, um, with your herbs and with your cooking. Now, I want to say a few things about um, propagation methods. Of course, one of the things that we all think of is that we can start from seed. Well, for many things that works really well, basil, for instance, starts really well from seed. Other things, however, and I'm thinking of rosemary in particular, is extremely hard to start from seed. It's very finicky. The temperature has to be just right. The moisture has to be just right. And so there's many other ways of propagating things like the, uh, like the uh, rosemary or so on. So when you look at the diagram on the... Um, upper right, you can see how you can actually propagate some of those um, shrubs. So you would take a side branch of a um, rosemary bush, for instance, and um, dig a bit of a hole, clamp it down with a piece of wire or something like that, and then erect the branch against a little bit of a stem, and then fill, it, fill the hole back up with soil. And if you do that and wait long enough and keep it nice and moist, before too long, you'll find that roots grow where it's clamped into the earth. Then you can cut it off the mother plant and you have a nice new rosemary plant. Similar to that, you can do semi-soft cuttings and that works well with a great number of things, including rosemary, but it also works for things like bay leaf and whatnot that are more shrubby tree-like. You take a cutting, that you see there, it's about 10 centimeters long. Uh, strip off the leaves. Make sure that the cutting isn't so hard that it's not likely to root. It should be semi-soft. So it should be flexible as you're moving it about. And then, as I said, strip off the leaves and then cut, off, uh, cut it off to about a five centimeter spur. Put it into some potting soil. Put that potting soil into some nice warm spot put a bit of a cloche of a plastic bag around it. And with some luck, you should have reasonable root formation. And the last thing I wanted to say in terms of propagating is root division. There are many things and, um, that do really well. Uh, tarragon, for instance, winter savory, uh, lovage, that you can dig up, tear the plant apart like you see in the bottom right, and um, each little shoot will have plenty of roots that you can pot up and start over. So once things, especially in your pot, get a little out of hand, then shake them out of the pot, divide it, and give the rest to your friends and have a new plant. Taking care of plants is another thing that we need to give some thought. And uh, one of the things is space and location. So in terms of location, most herbs prefer full sun. And when I say full sun, I'm talking about a minimum of, oh, about six hours a day. They also prefer a sheltered spot in soil with good drainage. I already mentioned uh, that so many of our herbs come from the Mediterranean, where the drainage generally tends to be very good. So um, you want to be sure that you give them the appropriate soil when you're either in your bed or in your pot. 
Soil wise, most plants like to have it slightly alkaline. If your soil is, if you're measuring it and if your soil turns out to be a bit on the acidic side, then just add some dolomite lime. Um, the other thing in terms of location is think what other plants in your, if you don't have it in pots, in pots it's easy, but if you have it in your garden, think of what other plants would like that kind of um, situation in terms of the good drainage, a lot of grit, and then put your herbs in that area that with other plants that have the same needs. And finally, um, in terms of space, think of what the maximum size is that your plant gets to and how much you'll need in the season. So for plants like rosemary or sage or oregano, you want to have three to four feet between the plants. For things like thyme, tarragon, savory, basil, oh, that's probably two feet is enough. And for some of the smaller plants like cilantro and chives and dill, one foot is enough. Trimming is another thing that you really want to keep on top of as far as herbs are concerned, because the best taste, the most of the essential oils that you want for the cooking is really in the new growth. And you want to let enough light and, uh, and air into the plant to really ensure good new growth. So a compact bushy plant, especially with the, the perennial type of herbs, will produce many more young, tender, tasty leaves. And then as you're harvesting, generally harvest the outer leaves so that the center keeps growing. And harvest first thing in the morning before the essential oils evaporate. R really what gives the herbs the taste is those essential oils. And so as the sun beats on that plant during the day, uh, a lot of that evaporates. So um, just make sure that you get the best bang for your buck by harvesting at the right time of the day. And then don't harvest too, too much, especially for some of the smaller plants like basil or dill, uh, don't harvest more than about a third of the foliage at any given time. So tidy up your plant, keep it nice and fresh, water it sufficiently, but not too much. And, uh, and you should have a lovely crop of herbs to last you the whole season. And for many things that are perennial, of course, they'll last many years. Now on soil, just to get you started, especially if you're thinking of uh, container mixes, if you're starting from seed, I very much recommend you start with a commercial mix because it's the right combination of moisture retention, but also drainage. So, and it tends to be fairly weed free so that um, it's a good start. But if you are wanting to make soil for your own containers and not necessarily buy soil, then here's a recipe and in the handout that April or Darby sent to you, um, the soil recipe is in there. So you have a half a bag of garden soil, some steer or mushroom compost, some peat moss. The coarse sand is very important for drainage, some fish compost or similar for fertilizing, and then a little bit each of uh, lime, gaia green and bone meal, and then you mix it well. Um, if you don't want to go through the trouble of mixing your own, then use some of the commercial outdoor container mix, but do add a little bit of additional sand and vermiculite or perlite, because I find that uh, the commercial outdoor mix just doesn't have enough drainage most of the time. Now, those were all the sort of peripherals, the generalities that go with growing herbs. And now I'm gonna start with A, and go to almost said as far as the herbs are concerned. And the very first one I want to start with is a beautiful herb and that's called agastash or licorice mint. And as you can see from the little insert, insert um, it's absolutely excellent for pollinators. So once the flowers get started and they last a long time, I mean, if you put them out into a container now, you'll probably have flowers in another four weeks. 
and they will last well into the fall. And all the time they will be covered with bees and little butterflies. And so it's an absolutely wonderful herb. Um, as the name says, it uh, has a bit of a licorice flavor, licorice minty flavor, nice in teas, but, um, and you could also put it into salad if you like the licorice minty taste, but primarily it's just such a wonderful pollinator plant and very beautiful to look at as well. It grows to about, oh, three feet or so. Um, in contrast to other mints, it doesn't uh, perpetuate itself through uh, the roots going everywhere. Well, they don't in containers, but if you were to have it in the garden, but it does self seed a little bit. So you have to keep a look out for that. The next A plant is arugula. Now I wasn't sure whether arugula is a herb or a vegetable or whatever, but it's such a wonderful plant. And in our area, you can grow it year round and put it into your salad. You can stir fry it. It has that lovely peppery taste. As you can see, this is in the depth of winter with all the fallen leaves, but the arugula is looking just fine. Starts very well from seed. Just keep seeding it throughout the season. You can put some out now, you can do it again in midsummer and late summer, and you'll have arugula the entire season. Very easy to start. There's all kinds of different ones. There's perennial arugula, there's different varieties, but uh, it's all arugula and it's all lovely. Now we all know about basil. It's a very tender annual. So in our area, it um, needs to be started indoors to uh, give you a good crop um, because it really does like a lot of warmth and sun. There's a multitude of different cul uh, culinary varieties. Cinnamon, emily, lettuce leaf, genovese, sweet, then the purple basil, never mind. And these are all the, the sort of tomato pairing basils. And then you get the um, holy basil, the sacred basil, and, uh, and the Thai basil, which are different flavors again. But they're all wonderful, great for cooking, nice smell. And as I said, they great for starting from seed in about May, April, so April, May. So now's a good time to start it inside and then transplant it in a into your outdoor either pots or garden in about June. So put it onto, into a container, cover it with soil for about a centimeter and then give it some warmth and it should um, start to germinate in about five to 10 days. And there, because it's very prone to damping off, I would definitely recommend sterile starter mix and then grow it in a well-ventilated area and then transplant it into loose, rich, well-drained soil and leave at least 20 centimeters between plants. And once it's growing very actively, then make sure that you pinch off the flower buds because uh, they're not so ideal in terms of cooking. And you'd want the leaves to go into your salad or into your pesto or whatever you're going to be doing with it. One of the interesting basils that I saw in the catalog is something called Emerald Tower that will actually grow a column of two to three feet tall. And it's said to be very flavorful. I haven't tried it, so I can't really speak to it. I personally like the uh, lettuce leaf or Genovese. They taste pretty similar to me. But anyway, basil is a great crop for cooking. One of the things that's less suitable for a patio or a other container garden is a bay, la bay laurel, but it's a marvelous thing if you have a bit of, of um, room, especially in the semi-shade, semi-sun, um, it grows to be a small tree or shrub, and it's just very a very pretty leaf, as you can see at the bottom right. It also makes some yellow flowers um, before all too long. And it fits into the category that I talked about earlier in terms of uh, semi-soft cuttings to, uh, to propagate it quite easily. And then you can have your crown of um, like in ancient Greece when the athletes wore their crown of laurel or whatever you want to do with it. So a great, a great plant to have around if you have some space. A very easy to grow annual is borage. It's um, according to the ancient Romans, 
it makes people happy. It certainly makes me happy when I put the little blue flowers into my salad. I just pick off the little flowers and sprinkle them over the salad. The leaves too are wonderful to have because they have a sort of um, fresh, almost cucumbery taste. So if you cut them up, um, they're, they're very lovely in a salad or in a dip. And apparently, but I haven't tried that, it's very good steamed as a spinach substitute. It self seeds very freely, so um, but it's so easy to rip out that it really doesn't matter. And it's just a lovely plant to have around. You can see that the leaves look a bit hairy, but by the time you chop them up, all that hairiness disappears. I'll go back to that in a second. There's a whole category of herbs called umbiliferous herbs. And so we're talking about the chervil that I just showed you, the cumin, the fennel, the um, cilantro, dill, they all fall into the same category of umbiliferous uh, herbs. And that really just means that you have a sort of umbrella shaped flower that makes seeds fairly readily. Um, again, what I really want to say about this category of herbs is that they are absolutely fantastic in terms of feeding not only the bees for pollinators, but the parasite, try, try that again, parasitoid wasps. And the parasitoid wasps are a great bonus in your garden if you can get them um, because they lay their eggs into various things like uh, the various larvae that eat your uh, other vegetables. They uh, help with the aphid control, all this kind of stuff. So if you grow plants that have these small flowers, like the ones I'm just showing you here, it's, um, it's a great bonus in your garden. So um, now I'll go into the individual flowers that fall into that category. And the first one I want to talk about is cilantro. Cilantro, also known as coriander. Um, in my terminology, I call it cilantro when I eat the leaves and I call it coriander when I use the um, seeds for a dried herb. So um, it's, it uh, self seeds fairly freely out of those umbels that I was just showing you. And um, so once you have coriander in your garden, then you'll probably have coriander unless you're diligent about it taking the uh, flowers off, you'll have coriander in your garden for the many years to come, or you can start again every, every spring. And then you can harvest the little fruits, um, berries for the, for the coriander flavor. Cumin is another one that's very attractive to the beneficial insects. Um, it is a little bit more tropical than the coriander or the dill. So you want to start it in our area anyway, indoors in February, and then set it out in April or even May in your garden or in your pot. And it'll give you that lovely cumin taste for whatever you want to use it for cooking. And of course, dill. And there's so many different varieties of dill that I can't go into them. This happens to be the giant, the mammoth, I should say, mammoth dill that people like to use for, for pickling because it has these very large flower stands that are great in pickling. Um, but there's many small ones, fern, leaf dill and so on. Again, you start them either outdoors uh, in the spring or if you want to beat the season a little bit, start them earlier. And, uh, and then you can harvest as soon as, uh, as soon as the ground warms up a little bit. And fennel. Fennel in our area comes in two varieties. It comes in the bronze fennel, which makes a very tall plant up to five, maybe even six feet tall. The leaves are, well, what do fennel leaves taste like? Very hard for me actually to describe any taste. I'd be hard pressed to, to say other than, well, they taste like fennel. But, um, but it's, um, wonderful to harvest the seeds because it makes a very calming tea. The seeds last a long time and, uh, and you can just use a, a few seeds, brew it um, with 
well, just boiling hot water and, um, and it makes a very calming tea. Used to be used a lot for calming down babies just to give them something to, to uh, suck on. But the other fennel that I think is a marvelous, you can call it a vegetable, you can call it a herb, doesn't matter, is the bulb fennel. And here you see the Selma Fino, Selma Fino bulb um, that is, has that typical fennel taste. And um, so grow it very rapidly so it doesn't get too stringy and then chop it up into salads or steam it or whatever you would like to do with it to give that sort of an aniseed like uh, taste. Or my favorite recipe actually is to chop it up real fine and chop up some oranges and mix it into a salad and uh, very, very delicious. But the key to growing good bulb fennels is to grow it quickly. So it needs fairly rich soil reasonably well-drained, but rich soil, so it really gets started very quickly. Um, you start the little guys, you start the seeds, oh, around about March, and then this time of the year, it's time to put them into the garden, and then by June, July, you have a lovely crop of fennel. The next one we're all familiar with, and that is the, the chives that you see on the left-hand side, the common chives. Again, a good pollinator plant. You see the little butterfly on there. It's just so beautiful. And we all know the, the use of chives with their little bit of oniony taste, but they're also just a very lovely ornamental plant. So grow them in a pot, grow them in a garden, grow them as a boundary to any flower bed and uh, they'll do so well and so easily um, transplanted. So chives is just a wonderful plant to have. The plant on the right hand side is also a chive. It's called garlic chive and it does indeed have a garlic flavor. It grows just like the common chives. It grows, both of them grow from a small bulb and so they're easy to transplant. You just uh, get a pot of chives and then rip it apart and uh, put the new plant wherever you want it and the bulbs will start up again. And by this time of the year, you should have a good crop of both um, the leaves or yes, the leaves. And uh, then before too long, you'll start to see the flowers. The difference other than the taste of the garlic chives and the common chives is that the leaves in the garlic chives are flat, as you can see on that picture, while uh, in the regular chives, they're more tubular but very easy to grow, very, very uh, tasty, and a lovely ornamental flower, if nothing else. A more uncommon herb is the curry plant. It belongs into the, into the daisy family, into the aster family, and it has a very strong curry smell and, uh, and also flavor. It, Biologically, it has nothing to do with the curry that we uh, use for our chicken and uh, whatever other di curry dishes, but it certainly has that flavor. It's also called uh, Italian straw flower or immortel, and it likes it in very dry, rocky, sandy ground, just like I was describing for some of the other Mediterranean flowers. Um, it's a lovely, the flowers are, make a very tasty herbal tea. And the leaves, of course, with their curry taste can be put into salad or whatever else you feel um, you might want to have that taste in. It prefers a very sunny sheltered position. And as I say, um, on well-drained soil. Um, it, in, in terms of um, areas that are colder than the east coast of Vancouver Island, it probably needs to be brought in in the winter, but here we can grow it outside. We are in zone eight, and so it does okay outside. It grows to about, oh, a good sized shrub of 30 inches or so. So that's an interesting plant if you're interested in that type of taste. And now we move on to garlic. That is one of my favorite 
herbs and I certainly grow a great deal of it. And you can see in the bottom right, that's in my basement. It's a fraction of my garlic supply that I have through the winter. But just in terms of growing it, um, you put it into the ground in, I put mine in in October here, but you can start as early as September. And uh, by the time it gets too cold in November, you probably don't want to be putting it in anymore. And you use one clove for every um, foot or so of growing. Put it with a pointy side up, put it down about, oh, 10 inches or so, maybe not quite, eight inches, and then just cover the soil up again, leave it for the winter, and uh, right about now, it would be good or, or a bit earlier, fertilize it a little bit, but leave it well enough alone. But you should be seeing the green sprouts coming out of the ground now, actually already looking pretty good and green. And then by July, you should be able to see the scapes. And when I'm talking about scapes, what do I mean? I mean the flower stand. Garlic is really interesting in the sense that it shoots up the leaves first, of course, and then out of the middle of the leaves comes a long tubular stalk. And at the end of that stalk is where the flower will be. But before the flower opens, it actually makes a 360 degree curl. And by the time it makes the full curl, but the flower hasn't opened yet, is a good time to cut that off to the first set of leaves. And garlic scapes, if you haven't tried them, absolutely delicious Then any stir fry or whatever else you would want to put garlic in. And the advantage of cutting off the flower is that more energy from the leaves goes into the bulb. And then you start harvesting in July, maybe even into August and the cycle repeats itself. It's very easy to grow, but the, there's one thing that in our area attacks it quite readily, and that is the garlic rust that you see on the upper right. You see those little pustules um, that cover the leaves. And the, the spores of that fungus actually live in the soil. So it's very important that if you're a keen garlic grower like I am, that you rotate it through your garden because uh, otherwise you have a continuing problem with that rust and that you give the plants enough space so that they can dry off very quickly because the um, rust thrives on cool moist conditions. So if the plants dry off quickly after a rain or after overhead watering, then it's much easier. So that's the only thing that affects the rust in our, that I know of the affecting the rust in our area. And you can prevent it by giving it the right conditions and making sure that you get some crop rotation. So that's my little story on garlic. Now, an unusual herb for most of us home gardener, but very doable as a home gardener is um, horseradish. So if you're keen on horseradish, um, that nice pungent flavor of it, then, uh, then try growing some. Um, but because it tends to be a bit weedy and tends to uh, walk away a bit, keep it contained. It's an excellent plant for container garden and very easy to start. Get a piece of root either from a garden supply or from a friend and, uh, and put it into the soil. And before too long, you should have a nice crop of horseradish. And if you, um, if you do harvest the root, because after all, that is what makes the horseradish paste, um, then you can just tip up the container, take all the roots out, keep a root or two for your next crop, and, um, and then grind up the rest with some vinegar and away you go. It's a lovely plant in a pot. But interestingly enough, it does not um, do well in terms of making seed because it rejects its own pollen. It needs another horseradish plant to, uh, to cross pollinate and to make any seed. And that really explains why some horseradish is so unbelievably hot and other horseradish is fairly mild. It's just a variation within the different plants. So they'll differ in hotness and in flavor, but it's a nice 
uh, easy plant to grow. We all know about lavender and there's so many different cultivars and different scents and um, and just lovely a lovely plant because it you can use the flowers in cookies you can sprinkle the leaves on uh, various other sweet dishes desserts a good pollinator plant as you can see there but trimming lavender is a bit of an art it needs to be trimmed right after flowering. So you remove the flower stalks that haven't been har harvested for potpourri or sachets. Um, and then it needs a bit of spring plume, uh, pruning to keep in nice shape. But the tricky part is if you prune it too much, you're actually, uh, you may kill the plant because it might not regrow. So prune it right after flowering and then just give it a light over in the spring. Lemongrass, who would have thought that one can actually grow lemongrass in our area? One always thinks of lemongrass as such a tropical plant, um, but you can actually grow your own if you like. So if you go to the grocery store, find the very freshest lemongrass plants that you can buy. And then when you get home, trim off a couple of inches, 10, five centimeters off the top of the lemongrass and look trim away anything that looks a bit dead. And then take that stalk that's left and put it into a glass of shallow water and place it on a sunny window. And after a few weeks, with any luck, you should start seeing tiny roots at the bottom of the lemongrass stalk. And then wait for the roots to mature a little bit more. And then you can grow it, put it into a pot in, and have lemongrass for the entire season. So, but you need to, um, to make sure that it has a warm enough spot. And so you probably need to start it time and again because it certainly wouldn't overwinter in our area. Lovage is a very close relative to celery or celeriac and it gets absolutely huge. Um, five foot easily. Um, if you want to get lovage, the best bet is to start it from a root cutting, get it from a friend from a root cutting, because the seed is incredibly difficult to, uh, to get started. It needs a lot of tiddling and freeze thaw cycle to break its dormancy. But like the other umbiliferous plants that I was showing you earlier, it's an excellent attractant for parasitic wasps that prey on cutworms and tent caterpillars and ex other things. And it's quite a pretty plant. Um, so if you have a, a niche somewhere in your garden, then put in a bit of lovage. But remember that it does get big. And it's a very strong flavor. So some people really like it and use a lot of it. Other people just like a single leaflet to put into their soup. You can grow it from seed, but I would definitely recommend that you start from, from a root cutting. Now here's a herb or two herbs actually that uh, are very common in cook, cooking. And you can see, I mean, some people absolutely feel they have to have marjoram. Some people are happily happy with just the oregano. They're very closely related as you can see from the Latin name. And uh, certainly amongst the oregano, there's a multitude of different ones in some very low growing, some tall growing, some different flower colors. All of them are Mediterranean native, and which means they like a fair bit of warmth, but they do well in our area. But if you want to start them, start them from seed, you need to be sure that you have a warm place and then only set them out when it's warm enough outside. So don't set them out now, wait until sort of, oh, till it gets warmer, till you would put your tomatoes out. And you certainly wouldn't want to put your tomatoes out yet. You want the soil temperature to be at least 15 degrees centigrade and, um, and that would uh, be okay for the oregano as well. And it's an excellent herb for, just like basil, I should have mentioned that when I was talking about basil, basil is an excellent herb for keeping on a sunny windowsill. 
and you can harvest and harvest and harvest if you pick it appropriately. And the same is true for oregano. You can put it into a pot and keep it in a nice uh, warm windowsill, sunny windowsill, and uh, keep, keep picking and having fresh oregano at your fingertips the entire time, or just have it on your patio or, or a deck. So oregano is a, a lovely, and marjoram are great culinary herbs. Mint, that's another excellent uh, candidate to grow in containers and rather grow it in a container than in a bed because it's through its uh, rhizomes, it just crawls and crawls and takes over a bed in absolutely no time flat. So keep it, keep it well contained. And then of course, there's so many different ones that have remarkably different tastes. I'm always surprised how different chocolate mint is from apple mint, is from pineapple mint, never mind peppermint and spearmint. And then there's various variegated forms. So a great variety of, uh, of different mints, but lovely for tea and salads, you name it. And easy, easy to grow um, because you can propagate them through root division. And then again, the question of, uh, should these really be called just like the arugula uh, herb or a vegetable, but these are the various mustards. So Mizuna is one of the Japanese type mustards that easily survives our winter here. So if you put nice little new plants in, in about oh, August, September, then you can pick little bits of Mizuna throughout the year to put into your greens, whatever, or steam, greens. But uh, my personal favorite is the giant red mustard. In the upper uh, picture, you see a very young plant. In the lower, there, hence the word red, lower picture, um, you see a plant that's actually in my garden now. I took that picture yesterday. And I planted the little guys out in, oh, early September. And they lasted all winter. I keep picking the leaves. It's a great thing to have uh, for various salads. So giant red mustard, I can highly, highly recommend. Very easy to start from seed. And you can start, um, save your own seeds because by now, uh, before too long, they'll be making seeds and then I'll start them again for next season. Parsley. Again, I mean, we all know about parsley. It's another great herb to have on your windowsill so that you have parsley year round. And there's so many different varieties. The top left is the forest green, the bottom right is the Italian flat leaf, but many, many other different varieties. If you look into the seed catalog, each one is slightly different in its flavor. So you have to find out what your personal favorite is. Um, this is a good time to actually seed the new variety, a new crop for the season. Parsley is a, is a plant that's called biannual. So the first year it only makes leaves and then you can pick and pick and pick once it's uh, to a good size. And then in the next year, and of course you can have it during the winter, in the next year, it's set and determined to make seeds. So you can pick some leaves off, but before too long, you'll find that the flower stalks shoot up and it'll make seed. And then it's not nearly as productive as it is in the first year when, when it makes lots of leaves. So you really do want to reseed it on an annual basis and try different plants because they are a little bit different. And, uh, and now is a good time to do it in just in a regular, in a regular garden soil. And here's a plant that's somewhat unusual. It's called Shizo or Perilla. And it, it originated um, probably in China or India, but uh, there's at least two different varieties as you can see on the picture here. The uh, top is the green variety, which is very beautiful to look at with the purple veins. And then the bottom variety, the picture I took this morning, um, is the purple variety. I either one that the taste is a sort of minty flavor, um, but it, it doesn't have the roots that it, it's not really a mint. It just has a sort of minty flavor. 
And the bottom one, the purple one, when you put it into a salad or, in, and I'm particularly fond of it in cucumber salad, uh, then it leaches out some of the purple and your salad is a lovely pink color from that. It sells, uh, try that again, self seeds very readily, it transplants well. So you can just let it do its own thing and uh, it'll self seed. And next year you'll have some more of the uh, perilla, either green or red in your garden. Grows to about a foot or so. And because it is so beautiful in its foliage, it is also a very good candidate in an ornamental bed. And that brings me to rosemary. And similar to lavender, which is closely related, it also comes in all different forms. It comes in a pendulous form that you see in the, in the right hand picture. It comes in a straight upright pick, um, form. It comes in a more creeping form. So all of them do well. Um, in our areas, they are all frost hardy. Well, almost all frost hardy, um, but in any colder climate, then you might have to bring them in in the winter. But here, certainly, you do very well by just keeping them outside. I have had two plants in pots probably for about 10 years, and I don't do a whole lot of anything with them other than keeping them watered in the summer. They're just very hardy and they're great. But I do want to fertilize them very regularly because as I said earlier, it's much better to have the new tasty soft foliage for your various culinary purposes than the sort of straggly woody stuff. Hard to start from seed, I think I mentioned that, but very easy to, uh, relatively easy to start from semi-soft cuttings. So choose the variety you like. And as you can see, it's a beautiful ornamental plant, especially the pendulous one, um, and great for, for bees and other insects. Sage is another variety that um, it comes, just to go back on the name, uh, comes salvia. It's the salvia that comes from the word salvare, which means to heal. So sage is very much considered a healing herb. And there's a multitude of different varieties, different colors, different leaf shapes, different sizes. And so it's very pretty in containers. I could even imagine a large container that has nothing but different sages in it just because they are so pretty. And as you can see from the little bee inset, it's an excellent pollinator attractant. The all sages, all the culinary sages make uh, purple flowers. I don't have a flower picture here, but um, they're very similar to other salvias that you grow for ornamental purposes. And so they're easily grown from seed. They can be propagated by layering. They can be propagated by softwood cuttings. Um, one of the things to remember though, and as I say, they do well in pots, but after about, oh, three, four years, they, in contrast to the rosemary that I just talked about, get a little tired of being in the pot and then it's time to rejuvenate the whole thing. So after three, four years, um, I would definitely start anew and enjoy the fresh, uh, fresh sage taste. Savory, being of German background, I know that uh, this is an excellent herb for beans. The German name is actually Bohnenkraut, which means bean herb. And both the summer and the winter ones are, are very tasty with beans. The summer one is an annual, so you have to seed that every year. It starts very easily from seed in a, in a good garden soil kind of condition. So very easy and you just uh, plant it, cut it, and um, then next year you start again. The winter is, as I said, a perennial um, that does well from root cuttings or from layering. It doesn't need much moisture, just like a lot of the other Mediterranean um, herbs. And it likes, just like I said earlier, um, the alkaline, the soil to be a bit alkaline. Should be trimmed very frequently to uh, prevent legginess and to keep the flavorful shoots from coming. 
Another somewhat unusual herb is sorrel. And uh, it um, grows well from seed. And you can start at oh, end of March or so. It prefers full sun and very rich and humus soil. And in contrast to the other herbs that I was talking about, it likes a little bit more acidic soil. And its leaves, actually, if you've never had sorrel, its leaves are quite pleasantly acidic. So it's nice as a salad herb or with many other things. And in your little handout, I actually have a recipe that asks for a fair bit of sorrel because it makes for a wonderful herb summer dish, but you do need that acidity from the sorrel. So have a look at the recipe. I, actually, I think it'll come up in my slides in before all too long. And now I better get on with it. Um, tarragon is a lovely herb to put into vinegar, flavor the vinegar, just put a whole sprig in with some vinegar and then let it stand in a sunny window. And after about three weeks in the sunny window, take the herb out and or strain it and have that very flavorful vinegar. Interestingly enough, it, the good tarragon cannot be grown from, that's the French tarragon, cannot be grown from seed. Like why, I don't know, but it just doesn't seem to make any seeds. So you always have to start it from root division. But uh, the root division is very easy and you can just do that regularly. And now just a few more and then we're at the end. Um, that's the next one is time and uh, we are just about out of it. But um, there's so many different times. There's the beautiful low growing ones with pink flowers that are not as good in terms of eating, that that's the creeping times they, that you grow between stones and near terrace. But um, many, many different varieties of thyme and the seed catalogs will list dozens of different um, culinary and aesthetic ones. From the culinary standpoint, the common thyme includes summer, winter, French thyme, and uh, that is one of the best culinary varieties that I can think of. And then of course there's lemon thyme and a few others that are very easy to, to grow and best grown from root cuttings. And now I think maybe we want to just skip some of the edible flowers, but um, they're so pretty. Grow some of the Johnny Jump Ups to harvest the flowers and put into your salads, grow some of the lemon marigolds and uh, use the petals in your flowers. And I just want to say one more thing about the herbs and that again is in your handout and that's on dry on drying herbs because we can't have access to the plants here around. So we want to, the recipe says, harvest on dry days. And I already talked about harvesting in the morning before the essential oils um, dissipate. And then rinse and pat dry, strip the leaves off the stems, and then put them not too thick, just a few layers, two to three layers, and then let them dry at room temperature and fluff them up occasionally until they crumbled. And that's the story on drying. And I won't bother to go into the recipe because you have that in your handout. And with that, I want to say thanks to, again, Joe Canning that Darby already mentioned. I want to say thanks to West Coast Seed because they gave me almost all of the images that you saw except the few that I took myself. And they have a great selection of seeds. And then the library has a goodly number of herb books. And I especially like the Complete Gardener's Herb Manual that you see there and that's in your handout as well. And with that, I'll take some questions. Great, well, Joe has been leaping into the chat and answering some as they come up, but we still have lots for you. Okay, we'll start at the top. Um, thoughts on those fabric type grow bags? The fabric type grow bags, 
I don't have any personal experience with them. I could see that they have real uses, but you have to really watch the watering because I suspect that the water just flows right out of them. And for some things that probably works very well, especially the plants that like to have drier conditions, but make sure um, my recipe for watering is to stick my finger in at least to the middle joint so that I feel not just the surface, but feel into the soil itself. And so with the grow bags, um, make sure that you really stick your finger into the soil to see how dry it is a little bit further down. But other than that, I could well imagine that they would work well. Great. And I'm just gonna, um, sorry to interrupt this flow. We haven't done this before. I'm just gonna um, launch a little poll for folks. We're curious where you've heard about uh, these events. So I'm just gonna send it to you and you could um, maybe click and say, um, but Dorothy's gonna tackle the next question while you're doing that. So the next one's from Jane. Are there shade or partial shade or herbs? A lot of the things that you just eat greens from, so for instance, parsley will do fairly well in partial shade. I mean, it likes the sun, but it doesn't have to have the sun. But a lot of the others like basil and so on, they want the full sun. I'm just trying to think, well, things like the arugula and the mustards, if you consider those herbs, will also do fairly well in not too, too much sun kind of think, um, but the bulk of them like like the full sun. So uh, not too, too many. Chives will probably do okay in partial sun. Mm. And I'm trying to picture my own garden because I don't have full sun in my entire garden, but um, yeah, they, they, they do like sun overall. So, so stick with the things where you're eating mostly greens, like the parsley, the, the, uh, the arugula, the mustards, that sort of thing. But all the Mediterranean herbs, sage, rosemary, uh, lavender, they all need a lot of sun. So uh, Dorothy, you talked about potentially growing things inside um, if people didn't have good natural light, for example, if they're in an apartment with a, a balcony that's not great or they don't have a balcony, they could grow some of these inside with a grow light? They certainly could. By the time you have a grow light and enough warmth, you can grow almost anything. But uh, if you don't have a grow light and just do it on a windowsill, then there's still a goodly number of herbs that do remarkably well. And I'm thinking particularly basil and um, oregano and uh, even chives would do for a while. You might have to rejuvenate them more quickly, but uh, those, those very common ones would do perfectly well on just on a sunny windowsill. Fantastic. Um, jo had chimed in with the grow bags. She she stopped using them because she couldn't keep the soil damp, she said. So just for the person who is asking about grow bags, um, they're very hard to keep moist, but if that's your only option, maybe you try it. <laughs> okay, next question. Should I have to change soil every year or use only fertilizer? And if fertilizer, please suggest a good fertilizer. Um, I, so I'm assuming the person is growing things in pots. I think so. And, and as I think I mentioned, I had certainly meant to, um, my, my rosemary has been in the same pot for, I'm guessing on to 10 years and I don't do a whole lot of anything for it. Um, my Sage too, I actually rejuvenated my sage this year, but it was in the same pot for at least four years. And uh, now it's come to the end of the road. So many things, you don't have to do a whole lot of anything, but if you can add a little bit of sea soil or some of the organic fertilizer, and my personal favorite of organic fertilizer is the Gaia Green, um, that you can get in most garden stores. And there's a variety of uh, Gaia greens. My, again, my personal favorite is the Gaia green 
444 because it's an all round organic fertilizer um, and it's approved by the um, by the organic gardening community. So it's a good one to use if you want to. But many things I would just let the plant tell you whether it's looking a bit peaked or whether it's looking pretty good and then make your choice in terms of fertilizer, whether it needs it or not. Great. Yeah, Dev did uh, confirm that it was about containers. So good guess. All right. Oh, no, I just. Oh, OK. What would I, an ideal soil pH level be for herbs? Slightly on the alkaline side for the bulk of them, with sorrel being maybe the exception. Um, so you know that pH 7 is neutral. Anything below 7 is acidic. Anything above 7 is alkaline. And I wouldn't go very alkaline, but just a little bit above 7, maybe 7, yeah, not more than 7.5 for sure. And, and add, if, if your soil is on the acidic side, add a bit of dolomite lime. And on Vancouver Island, do we tend to have acidic soil? Yes, on uh, Vancouver Island, it, almost all the soil is fairly acidic. That's just because a lot of the, um, the rain that we have leaches things out. And so it tends to be on the acidic side. So it sounds like having some dolomite lime is a great tool in your garden shed. Is a good tool in the garden shed for sure. Okay. What would you use in place of peat moss? No other context. <laughs> oh, that is such a tricky question. I'll do my best to answer it, but in the end, it becomes a personal choice. Um, peat moss, yes, it, there are some real issues in terms of, uh, you know, digging up peat bogs and they're such a great carbon sink and so on. So I'm always a little hesitant to, to say, um, oh, don't use, or do use peat moss because it's such a great moisture retention um, component. But having said that, there's not that many alternatives around. The alternative is the coconut fiber, the or however you want to pronounce it. And that environmentally is also not ideal, aside from the fact that it has to come from a long way away. It doesn't, um, and, uh, and the coconut plantations are, you, know, you can discuss that at some length as well. And so what are your other choices really? And I wish there was an answer. Uh, making your own compost, of course, is ideal, and then you don't have to add a whole lot of anything, but making compost is um, a challenging enterprise, and not everybody has the space to do it, so it's, it's just one of those tricky questions, and you have to see where your own personal choice lies between those two difficult choices. Thank you. I have garlic chives and every year near the end of the season, they're covered with tiny black bugs. Do you know what the bugs are? No, <laughs> it's a short answer. But having said that, you could photograph the bugs and send it in to the gardening advice line at Milner Gardens and Woodlands. And there's people that answer questions on a weekly basis and they'll do their level best to, uh, to find out what those bugs are. Whether they can or not is a different question, but it's called the Gardening Advice Line at Milner Gardens in Woodland. Okay, uh, maybe April can pop that into the chat for us. Yeah, that, that would be good. Yeah, I think that's great. Are chives perennial? Yes. Yes. Yes, they are. But having having said, because they grow from bulbs and they will come up year after year. But if they're in one spot for too long, then of course the ground gets a little bit depleted and the chives get uh, less and less vigorous. And so I recommend moving them around or digging them up, putting new soil in and, uh, and giving them a new start. But they certainly are perennial. Perfect. Somebody's popped the gardeningadvice.milnergardens at shaw.ca address in there that Dorothy was talking about. Great answer on the chives. I'm going to have to do some maintenance on my herbs. <laughs> right. <laughs> I've been neglecting them because they're so easy. <laughs> 
do you fertilize garlic only once in the spring? I give them a good start. I Again, the Gaia Green that I mentioned earlier, when I plant my clove, um, then, then I into the planting hole, I put about a tablespoon of the Gaia Green powder. I mix it in um, so that it's not too strong. And then I set the clove on top and then I fertilize them again in the spring. Oh, okay. So once when you're planting and then- Once when I plant, and once again, right about now. Perfect. Uh, from Kay, if you cut the scape, the garlic scape sooner, wouldn't the bulb be larger? Everyone says to wait for a curl, but I don't know why. That's an interesting question. I'm not sure I have a, a particularly good answer to that. I always thought that you just, um, do it because you want to have a good amount of scape to actually eat. But is there a reason why you shouldn't? I, I really honestly don't know. Um, I could imagine that maybe the plant would try to make another scape if you did it too early, but I'm truly guessing. Well, maybe Kay will try it this year. If she doesn't <laughs> let us know next year. And then she'll let us know. <laughs> Kay's going to be our, our proving ground here. Mm -hmm. All right, is lemongrass a perennial? Is lemongrass a perennial? Well, certainly not in our climate. Um, is it in its native area of uh, Thailand and other warm climate in the Far East? It probably is, is my guess, because it probably belongs into the grasses and uh, that end of things. But um, but in our area, I think you'd be hard pressed to uh, maintain it for more than just a season. Okay, even with our amazing climate. So Kay has an update about the garlic scapes. It does not grow a new one. Does not grow a new one. In okay. that case, you can probably harvest it anytime that you feel like it. Great. Maybe you could, she could still do an experiment, do half of them at the one time and the other half. There you go. So Kay, you're still on the hook for your experiment. Um, somebody else has similar tiny black bugs on their mint of rear. What are they? They can ask the, gar the gardening line at Milner, I'm guessing yeah. too. And, and that's true for any gardening questions, herbs or otherwise that you have. Um, send, send those questions in and you should be able to get an answer within a week. Excellent. All right, does mint like good drainage? My mint never does well. I thought you couldn't kill mint, but um, it does like fairly decent soil and that in the decent soil includes decent drainage. So, um, but growing it in a pot, you should be able to uh, give it just the kind of conditions that it likes. Okay, will parsley reseed itself? Yes, it will. But of course you have to wait until it forms the blossom and seeds the following year. And then it won't start to germinate until either very late in the season and probably not be big enough to harvest anything from. But you, if you wait one more season, i.e. the second year, third year after you uh, planted the original plant the third year, you should be able to get a crop of parsley, new crop of parsley. So it takes a while. Okay. Uh, question, why do you rinse your herbs? Why do I what? Rinse them with water. Oh, well, I like to get the dust off for one thing. Um, and any little bugs that might accidentally cling to it, or if I've dropped some and I have a bit of grit on it or something like that. So it's just a cleanliness thing. There's nothing that says you have to rinse it. That's totally up to you. Okay. Good stuff. Um, could you speak to the herb Parcel? It's P-A-R-C-E-L. I got one at a CD Saturday looks like parsley and tastes like celery. I've heard of that uh, cross. 
but I can't speak to it because I haven't ever experienced it. But I know it exists and, uh, and it'd be interesting to know how well it actually does in our region in terms of growing it outside. And is it more like parsley or is it more like celery? I, I really not have, I don't have any personal experience with it. Okay, this, this Kathleen, you will have to report back as well for next year. <laughs> that would be good. <laughs> um, how best to avoid bringing in insects when taking herbs indoors in the fall? Rinse them off outside. Okay, good. Linda is asking what to do with old rosemary losing needles and yellowing. Lives in the ground, outdoors and exposed area. Yeah, it, it falls a little bit into the lavender category. If you uh, cut it back too, too much, it may not, it may not survive the treatment. And so I would say at some point, you may just have to bite the bullet and get a new rosemary plant. But I mean, in the meantime, you can do a fair bit of pruning. You haven't got anything to lose. If you do too much, as I said, for the, the lavender and rosemary the same, then, well, you've lost the plant, but you then wanted to start a new one anyway. But give it, give it a good pruning. Maybe even if you're really desperate, dig it up, give it some new soil, and, uh, and see if you can give it a new start. Hard to do that. Yes, hard <laughs> to do that because they get pretty big. <laughs> Another rosemary question. Can you prune back rosemary hard, like taking out one third? If you, I could see taking out one third from the center and so on. So don't just um, take the hedge trimmer to it, but rather judiciously, like you would with other shrubs, judiciously take out a branch here, take out a branch there, especially some of the older, uh, less attractive branches, the uh, crossing branches, just like any other pruning you want to, uh, A, never take out more than a quarter to a third, or you want, and you want to make sure that you get the, leave the best ones. We also have a previous session about an intro to pruning. Um, so if you're really curious about more about pruning, you can watch that other session too. Okay, great. Um, so Amanda's asking, first steps for someone brand new to growing culinary herbs, live in a fairy, fairly natural area, but in an apartment building with a deck. Yeah. You should be doing, able to do all kinds of herb growing in containers. Choose the containers you find the prettiest and, uh, and most useful in terms of what I said earlier about, uh, you know, the, the dark containers versus the glazed containers versus the frost-free containers or making use of nice baskets that you line with uh, plastic and uh, just drill some holes for drainage. So your imagination is really what limits you in terms of containers, maybe imagination and pocketbook, but uh, you should be able to grow any amount of herbs with the exception maybe of the tall ones like lovage or the big ones like bay leaf, but almost anything else would go. Some people like to go all in and get 10 things and other people like to get two things. So you know what kind of person you are too, once you've got your containers. <laughs> and what kind of flavors you like in terms of your culinary needs. Totally, stuff you use is generally a good bet, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, I mean, some people absolutely cannot tolerate cilantro. It, it's um, a genetic thing that some people get an acutely soapy taste when they eat cilantro and other people like me love fresh cilantro. So uh Thank you, Pam. One last question about rosemary. Why would I ever even bother pr pruning rosemary? Is there any purpose to, do you have to prune it? You don't have to prune it, but remember for the herbs, you want the soft, tender and flavorful portions of the plant. And so if your plant is fairly old and a bit woody, then you do want to do a little bit of judicious pruning so you get new growth and nice uh, tasting fresh sprigs. Excellent. So um, if anybody 
else was interested about that parcel, Joe says it's also called Chinese parsley. So you can check in the chat for that, that Latin name. Um, the pruning class will send out the link. Um, somebody's asking about the pruning video. We'll send out the link to the whole back catalog of videos with after the session. Um, question is, is there any, uh, any way to keep cilantro from bolting? Harvest, harvest, harvest. <laughs> Having said that though, eventually the plants are just set and determined and you cannot keep up with the harvesting and it will make a flower absolutely regardless, but you can stretch out the season fairly, fairly well. And so the answer is just keep reseeding so that you keep having fresh cilantro because eventually you will not be able to keep it from flowering. But you are not alone, Alan. Okay, what is the best place to buy plants, seeds, and garden supplies in Nanaimo, in your opinion? Well, I'm very, I'm very biased, and I'll come right out and, uh, and show my colors here, because I do a lot of volunteer work at the Bebbin Learning Gardens. Um, Bebbin Learning Gardens are on the Bebbin campus, i.e. where the rink and the swimming pool and whatnot are. Uh, between the VIX sheds and the golf course. And, uh, and the Bebbin Learning Gardens make fantastic herb transplants. They also make fantastic everything else transplants in the edible variety. So whether you're talking tomatoes or cucumbers or you name it. But anyway, Bebbin Learning Gardens open every Wednesday from 10 till noon. And the next big sale is on May 13th. So that was my little tout for the Bevan Learning Gardens. Okay, so May 13th this year, everybody should come get their starts. Like Absolutely. Plants. Do you have anything, do you sell other things aside we, one shop stop or do they have to go other places for their soil and things? And we only do plants. We're all okay. volunteers and uh, we start things from seed at the appropriate time of the year for the, for the season. Excellent. That is good. Okay, I think this is the last question. Can you freeze fresh herbs? If so, how? I frozen scapes, but not herbs. I know some people preserve them in oil. Yeah, yes, I was just going to say this preserve in oil. You can certainly freeze them. You can dry them, as I've already pointed out. Um, make sure that they're in an airtight container. Ziploc is good. But the idea of packing them really tight into some kind of jar and then filling the, packing them really tight and then putting oil on top and then closing the lid is a wonderful way to go. And then you can just take out a spoonful at a time as you need it for your cooking. Yeah. Well, that's great. Um, okay, last, for real last question. What time is the, is the Learning Gardens open on Wednesday? <laughs> 10 till noon. 10 till noon, okay. I'm sure we've got lots of folks from Nanaimo in this, this crowd, as well as Florida. And Probably. Great. Well, um, do you have any final words for us? I really enjoy them. Try different ones. There's so many different varieties. If you've only had one type of time in the past, Try a different type of thyme. If you never had any lovage, try a plant, try some fennel, just be experimental and also be experimental in your cooking and have fun with it. <laughs>